you can tell, what we're talking about today is serving one another. And it falls within a grouping of Cross this autumn where we have already been looking at how do we love one another, how do we honour one another, how do we teach, how do we pray, how do we spur each other on. So today, do you feel like one of these sorts of servants? Andy and I, over the lockdown, I have to say, I'm not sure this is a confessional or not, we watched the whole of Downton Abbey, all those series. And so we got very familiar with servants like this, the butler standing calmly, watching, waiting to serve the master as soon as he or any of his guests needing support. And we know in that series that the people downstairs and some of those people have the stories of wanting to become people upstairs. They don't like being the servants. They don't feel comfortable. They feel like there must be more to life than this. And maybe as you've heard this morning, maybe you feel like I'm done with serving. I'm tired of serving. COVID, we know, has worn people out. We've been separated. We've struggled with relationships. And now we're all back together again and there's uncertainty. Are we wearing masks? Are we not wearing masks? And life doesn't feel free as we want it to. And into the midst of that, we have the blessing of moving into this new church building. And we've seen new people come into our midst and that's wonderful. But sometimes then we just want to stay in this room and be here rather than serving. I know that Shona was going to talk to us about the needs in the young people Though we have had more young people enter into this building over the last few weeks, what a responsibility. But to cover the needs of that, we need people willing to be serving with those young people. That's just one area of need. But this is not for me to come and make you feel guilty. What the passage I want to speak from today is far from that. It is actually watching the way that Jesus was liberated and we are following in his footsteps. So we are going to be looking at this passage, one that many of you would be very familiar with. I'm going to read it slowly. Put yourself in the picture. Here you are at a table with Jesus. There were 12 disciples there. They have just had the Passover. They had gathered together. The Passover was the festival when they remembered the liberation of their people from the slavery of the Egyptians. It was awful for those Israelites under Egypt's rule. And then God did the miraculous and released them by using Moses. And the time of the Passover festival was to remember that and to go, God is on our side. So they've just had that supper together. And so we pick up the story. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table. He took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. I'm not leaving, don't worry. How are you feeling right now? Oh goodness, she's got a bowl. She's got some soap. I've got a towel. I've got water. Oh dear, it's not coming out. (laughs) 
I really deliberated with God. Do I do this? Do I ask if anybody here would be willing to have their feet washed by me? Now how are you feeling? (laughs) I've got friends in this auditorium. Am I going to embarrass any of them? Are you going to think, oh no, please, don't pick on me? I'm not. But I wanted just to highlight the fact that Peter, Peter's reaction would have been probably like our reaction if you understand the reality of what Jesus is doing at this moment. He is breaking down all established ways of thinking. He was the rabbi. He was the leader. He was the one who had the disciples around him. This was not comfortable for them. They did not like Jesus washing their feet. We go on. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Sorry, I need to go back one. Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Do you like Simon Peter? I do. He's just wild. One minute he's like, no! And the next minute he's like, okay, all of me, all of me. Wash every part of me. He's this kind of emotional, bubbly person who so wants to get it right, but he's confused at this moment. How is it possible that the rabbi is going to do this thing? This is not the way it should be. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Their feet may have looked something like this. And Jesus got up. He took off the robes, which would have been the way he would have dressed. He took it off. He wasn't getting that dirty. The robe that probably would have been something they were very familiar, maybe quite a nice looking robe. He takes it off. He gets the towel. He wraps it round himself. And he gets lowly. And he washes feet that look like that. Or something like that. Twelve pairs of feet. And one of them was an enemy. One of them was going to betray him. Serving in his following can be a messy, difficult, dirty business. And sometimes, as we are called to serve as Jesus served, it's not only to the people who like us, who are on our side, but we are given an example Jesus had broken any image of hierarchy in the way that he acted here. He had shown that lowly jobs were not below him. And that response of Peter's shows just how uncomfortable that was for him and the other disciples around the table. I've heard people talk about the fact there are some people who just naturally are the servers But does that mean there are some people who are naturally the receivers in our culture today? I've heard people say things like, if you want something done, ask a busy person. You know, you're always seeing people doing, doing, doing. Some people are the natural encouragers. But we are all able to encourage each other 
if we dare to think about how we could do that. Jesus is at ease in both positions. He receives help from the disciples. He was a typical rabbi in some respects. He had people who listened to him. He went out and he taught. But in other ways, he was so different. He would reach to the people in this society who the other people didn't want anything to do with. I believe we as a church are called to reach out to the people who up till now may not have come through our doors. We are called to be big hearted because really this uh, piece of scripture is not really about foot washing, is it? It's about the fact that we need hearts that are open to go wherever God would send us, to be with whatever group of people he would put us with. We need to know that our identity is in knowing we are a child of God. We are the robe wearers, as we have been reminded this morning. Jesus knew who he was. This, in verse 3 of the part that I read, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and he'd come from God and would return to God. Jesus knew his identity. How well do we know ours? Do you believe you live your life before an audience of one? Or do you still feel cajoled by feeling like you've got to please people, your parents, your, your family, people in the church maybe, people in your community? For years, I have to say, I probably have been a people pleaser. And it's been a journey in my life to kind of rip that off constantly as the scriptures would speak to me time and time again that I did not have to please other people. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want to please other people, but doing it from the right reason, for my heart to be free. Suppose God has an adventure for you that you have not yet taken up the challenge to do. Supposing God has a new area that he would like you to serve in, are you willing to do whatever he asks of you, but know that it's because you're doing it as a response to him? In our normal everyday lives, what helps or hinders us serving? people. I was thinking about this and just came up with some fairly obvious things and I wonder what you'd add to this. What helps us serving if we think we're good at something, if we enjoy it, we see a positive outcome, maybe if we get affirmation or we're asked personally. Those are the sorts of things that will often help us to think, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll serve. I know my gift set, I've done my questionnaire, I know where I fit, so I'm gonna do this thing. But every journey into a new thing starts with the first step, and sometimes those first steps are really uncomfortable. You might look at the people on this platform and think, well, they do this week in, week out, it's easy for them, they're musical, they know how to do it. I know that there's a cost involved for these folks as they come up week after week. You might look at the people who speak on this platform and think, oh, they do it so well, they're brilliant or whatever. Maybe not. But it doesn't come easily for some people, but it's only because I know, as I've talked with the worship group, they do it because they know that God has asked them to. So where is it that God has an adventure for you? What's hindering you? Do you feel like I don't have time or energy? Okay, maybe you don't feel very skilled at something. You're not sure you enjoy it. You just, you've done it once and you didn't get a lot of encouragement so you have given it up. Or maybe somebody's not asked you. I'm asking us to ask ourselves, to ask God this question this morning. Where do you want me to serve you? It's a simple question. Do we believe God speaks into our hearts, into our beings, into our thoughts? I do. 
He wants us to be free, just like he was free to break all the rules as he sat there with the disciples. He wasn't contained by having to follow their rigid Jewish ways anymore. He was saying, no, know who your identity is based on and go and serve wherever you are sent. And we know from the stories of the scriptures that what he asked of some of those disciples was not going to be an easy thing at all. I think we know from history that at least all, all but one of those disciples was killed in their job for following him. Hardly an indictment to come and join the Christian church because he might ask you to do something you don't feel comfortable with. But when you know your identity as the child of the God who loves you more than any other being ever has, it changes our perspective. The passage that Dave set aside is this one from Galatians. And it's Paul writing to the people of Galatia who had been um, following in um, walking the Christian life and then those people had come into their midst and told them, actually, no, you need to also latch onto this freedom that you talk about. You need to obey the rules of the Jewish ways of doing things. And Paul is furious. Actually, if you read the whole of Galatians, you see the passion of this man. He's going, don't do it. Don't follow rules. Don't follow what other people say. Live in the liberation that I have given you. And this is in chapter 5, towards the end of the book. He's saying to them, look, it's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. We might think of freedom more like this, if your bodies would jump like that. That sort of no responsibility, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I have to say sometimes when I go off on holiday, you know, put, put down my responsibilities as a church leader and go off on holiday. I feel a bit like that. I'm not responsible, but that's not the freedom that God is talking about here. He's talking about that inner freedom of your heart to do whatever he asks us to do. I love this photo of freedom recently. This little girl had been under the Taliban rule and she arrives in Belgium and one of the newspaper photographers took this picture. What joy. She's free, free of that horrible situation. Arrived in a new country and she's starting afresh. When we become followers of Jesus, we should be looking, feeling that way, even if you're not skipping externally. The freedom you've got, you don't have to obey rules to be loved by Jesus. I came across this prayer, which is written, um, the, the uh, Methodists often will use this when they have a new person coming into the ministry. And this is a challenging prayer, and I, as I read it, just ask yourself, is this something I can agree with. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, you're mine and I'm yours, so be it. And the covenant which I've made on earth, let it also be in heaven. Do you see in those words the freedom that comes from knowing I'm no longer my own, I've been bought. 
I've been bought because Jesus died for me. I've been given a free life. And if you've said yes to Jesus, then you have too. And if we know that, then it means that he can send you, ask anything of you, because you want to follow in Jesus' footsteps. You've had your feet cleaned. You have received. So are you free to give out? We may not like the idea of put me to suffering. Suffering... Who wants to suffer? But will I suffer if it's following in what God is asking me to do? Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Most of us struggle when we feel like we haven't got a purpose. We need a purpose. But sometimes in in our lives, there are periods where we're less obviously purposeful. Let me be full, let me be empty. We know that there's huge costs sometimes for disciples of Jesus who follow this. We know that for some of our own mission partners. Some of you, are, you read their updates and some of them are exuberant and wonderful and other times it's really tough. But it also can be really tough doing the ordinary mundane things as I could call them here within the church. Who, who likes doing the things week after week when you're tired and weary? When you don't feel like you want to go and help in the children's group or, or come to a worship practice or do whatever it is you're doing. There are days that you get up and you think, I don't want to. So what will spur you on at that moment to say, not my will, but yours. You've given me a responsibility, so I will do it. But not do it like the grudging Jacob, but do it willingly and go, okay, I'm tired, but I'll get up and I'll do it. It comes from knowing whose you are. You are a child of God. You are a king's kid this morning, which happens to be my Twitter name. My kids think that's silly, but I actually think I like being a kid of the king because there's kind of a sense of freedom in that. Sometimes he asks us to do things that we are very skilled for too. And that's a whole lot easier then, isn't it? But really this is about our hearts. Are we free from the curtailment of what others think? But are you free from the curtailments of what your own life has taught you about yourself? Are you free to say, I'll do it because you asked me to, Jesus? You know that uh, for me, I've had the luxury of some overseas travel. And uh, I went to this dedication of this church building that you'll see behind me. And that building was built one brick at a time. Not by the people you might think of but by these women and others like them. These were women of the village who had a vision from God. 60 years, 50, 55 years earlier, these women or the people of their tribal group had had missionaries who come from the UK, from America, from Canada. And those mission partners there had actually died in that village. And these women felt that's not okay that they died and there's nothing to show for what they did for us. And so they served their community by making bricks. They went down to the river, they gathered the sand and the clay and they made bricks. And then they put them in this sort of furnace that that's how they made bricks. And there was a labor of love And then I had the joy of going to that dedication and there were thousands of people who came to say thank you to God for the people who had served them. And I, as these women were making the rice and the beans and we got served food, I just thought, isn't it remarkable that ordinary people realize that they have the ability to do something out of the ordinary And so they did. They built that building as glory to God, but also for the future generation. 
Now, we probably will never be asked to build a building because we've got one here and we have been given the ability to use it. But a challenge to us all is, how are we going to participate now moving forward? Yes, you may have given money and you may give more, but where else is God asking you to be involved in this community? We're a family. And just like in a family where there's things to be done, we all need to be able to get down and do the dirty things. Maybe wash, clean some floors, serve the teas, clean the toilets, whatever it might be. Or he may ask you to work with the children or be a hub host. We need hub hosts, folks. And that might be a job you think, well, I'm just sitting there, nothing happens. But over the last few weeks, we've had people come into this building and have tours around because the hub hosts has welcomed them warmly and given the opportunity to ask questions. And you come through here and you can tell the story of Jesus because you say, well, this is a baptismal pool. And in here we have people when they have come to know Jesus, they're baptized. And then we go around there, we go to the prayer room and we say, we believe that God hears our prayers and he is answering our prayers constantly. And people in that hub host role have had great opportunities and they come out actually really enthusiastic. So what might look like a less exciting job? You suddenly find you've got opportunity to share your own story. I would encourage us all, whatever we currently are doing, what is it that Jesus is asking you to do? Remembering we are serving like Jesus. We're responding out of love because he loves us more than we'll ever understand. Until we get to heaven, we won't really truly understand. But the more we read scripture, the more we encourage each other and actually see God at work, we get more and more understanding of how much we're loved. You and I are loved people. So let also us follow in the footsteps of Jesus and serve each other. Let me just pray for us. Lord God, you know it's certainly not my intention to make anybody feel guilty. You know what has helped or hindered us in the past to serve and what may now be in the way. I ask that we would freely just listen. What are you asking us to do now? Continue in what you've already called us to or is there another area? What do you want us to set down that maybe we've done that you're saying, no, not now. We want to be people who hear you, but also we want to be people who just feel your freedom this morning afresh to serve from a heart place where we are truly aware of the love that you have for us. Amen.